Omar hits back at McCarthy over committee seat threat. Major strike looms as rail union rejects White House brokered contract. Senate report confirms a systematic medical abuse of migrant women in ICE detention. Human traffickers capture thousands of refugee children across Europe. FIFA names Palestinian refugee as World Cup ambassador in Qatar. Azentio Software wins Excellence in Islamic Banking Solutions Award at Finovec Saudi Arabia 2022. From Chicago studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samana Siddiqui. Our top story tonight. On Sunday, U.S. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar vowed to continue fighting for more equitable, more just, and more humane policies. Omar's comments came after Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy threatened to remove her from the Foreign Affairs Committee if he becomes the Speaker. The Minnesota Democrat said McCarthy has repeatedly singled her out for scorn and hatred, including threatening to strip her committee assignment. She added, it does nothing to address inflation, health care, or solve the climate crisis. Omar said it is a continuation of a sustained campaign against Muslim and African voices. The Republican Party has been trying to ban those voices since former President Donald Trump. Trump first ran for office, she said. Members of the largest railroad workers union in the United States voted to reject a contract negotiated with the help of President Joe Biden's administration. That raises the prospect of a major strike or lockout as employees revolt over profitable rail giants' refusal to provide adequate paid sick leave for workers. The Transportation Division of the International Association of Sheet, Metal, Air, Rail and Transportation Workers, also called SMART, said over 50 percent of its members voted to reject the proposed contract. Members of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, the second largest rail union in the U.S., voted to ratify the contract, the union said. However, if any of the rail unions decide to strike, the others have vowed to honor their picket lines. Smart TD said a strike or lockout could begin as soon as December 9th. Smart TD represents employees on every Class 1 railroad, as well as employees on many regional and short-line railroads. Jeremy Ferguson, the union's president, said a settlement would be in the best interests of the workers, the railroads, shippers, and the American people. Uruj Rahman, a 31-year-old human rights lawyer from New York, was sentenced to 15 months in prison on Friday. That was for firebombing an empty New York City police vehicle. Rahman was arrested while performing the act with another lawyer, Colin Ferd Mattis, during protests over the murder of George Floyd in 2020. She spent the last year representing low-income New Yorkers facing eviction. Rahman and Mattis have been disbarred. Mattis is scheduled for sentencing next month. Legislation proposed in Springfield, Illinois, would require all state-run facilities to make halal or kosher meals available upon request. The Daily Herald reports that this would include schools, hospitals, and prisons. State lawmakers are expected to consider the Faith by Plate Act when they resume their fall veto session after Thanksgiving. The Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition is urging faith communities to come together in support of the proposed legislation. Halal and kosher meats and foods must follow specific requirements related to their slaughter and preparation as prescribed by Islamic and Jewish laws. Such options are available at grocery stores and some restaurants throughout the Chicago area, but that's not the case in settings such as prisons, hospitals, and schools. The formation of the most right-wing government in Israel's history has rattled segments of the American Jewish community. Michael Koplow, director of the Israel Policy Forum, termed the new far-right coalition alongside an alliance of ultra-Orthodox and ultra-nationalist parties a superstorm. So far, leading U.S. Jewish organizations have not been overtly critical of the election results. But progressive Jews are hopeful it will open the community's eyes to Israel's mistreatment of Palestinians. Activists have told Middle East Eye that Jewish institutions are likely to remain steadfast in their support of Israel. But the new government may push more Jewish Americans to question the legitimacy of those institutions as their representatives. They said it could also force the Jewish community to reckon with whether Israel has any interest in ending its occupation of the Palestinian territories. After an 18-month investigation, the U.S. Senate on Tuesday published a report and held a hearing on the medical abuse of women jailed in Georgia by immigration authorities. 
U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, has been accused of covering up the widespread mistreatment by deporting survivors and witnesses. John Ossoff, chair of the Senate Investigations Subcommittee, called the mistreatment a catastrophic failure by the federal government to respect basic human rights. The report pertains specifically to ICE's Irwin County Detention Center in Osceola, Georgia. The subcommittee investigated numerous allegations of medical abuse at the private prison, including alleged high rates of forced hysterectomies. It also investigated excessive and unnecessary gynecological procedures, medical neglect, and other mistreatment. The report was written by the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. It is chaired by Ossoff, a Georgia Democrat. Human traffickers capture thousands of refugee children across Europe. Details after the break, so stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. I am what hunger looks like in America. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Stop this genocide, we need your help. Welcome back. Thousands of children who lost their parents while migrating to Europe fall prey to human traffickers or the organ mafia. Zahra Hopiar, a researcher at Sakadia University's Diaspora Research Center in Turkey, assessed refugee children who went missing in Europe on World Children's Day on November 20th. Hopiar told Andalou Agency the cases of missing immigrant children in Europe began with the refugee crisis in 2015. The number of unaccompanied children in Europe has increased significantly in recent years, and they are being deprived of basic rights such as education, food, and health. The whereabouts of refugee children who fled Ukraine due to Russia's war are unknown. International non-governmental organizations have documented the use of missing children in illegal activities such as prostitution and human trafficking. It is unknown how many children have disappeared, how many are alive, and where they are located. On Monday, Pakistan reopened a key border crossing with neighboring Afghanistan for trade and pedestrian movement after a week-long closure. The southwestern Chaman border, one of the two main crossings between the two neighbors, was sealed on November 13th. It was closed following the killing of a Pakistani border troop by an armed Afghan. The decision to reopen the border, known as Friendship Gate, was taken after a series of meetings between officials of the two border forces. Chaman Deputy Commissioner Abdul Hamid Zehri said the Afghan side has assured it would hand over the suspect to Pakistani authorities. Thousands of people, mainly Afghans, cross daily into the two bordering areas for medical and labor purposes. Azentio Software, a Singapore-based technology firm, has won the Excellence in Islamic Banking Solutions Award at Finovex Saudi Arabia 2022. The award was presented to Azentio on November 8th at a ceremony in the capital, Riyadh. The Finovex Awards celebrate outstanding achievements in the banking and finance industry. 
Azentia won for its One Banking Islamic Software Suite. A bank suite is a web service providing validation and identification of U.S. routing numbers, as well as international bank codes and account numbers. The award was in recognition of One Banking's track record in helping financial institutions accelerate digital transformation, maintain high operational efficiency, and meet their growth objectives. The suite includes a range of Sharia-compliant software offerings catering to the requirements of new, innovative financing and investment products. FIFA has named Wissam Qutb, a Palestinian refugee and social media influencer, as a World Cup 2022 ambassador in Qatar. Qutb posted a video on social media saying, from a refugee with no place in the world to the World Cup ambassador. Qutb has millions of followers on Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. He posts comic clips and his hip-hop songs. The FIFA 2022 World Cup kicked off Sunday in Qatar. The games are being held for the first time in the Middle East and hosted by an Arab and Muslim country. A group of Sunni religious leaders and imams in Iran's Kurdistan province have called for a referendum under the supervision of international bodies. The Sunni clerics of Sanandaj and Dehgolan in western Iran called for the move to get out of the current situation. Mulavi Abdul Hamid, the top Sunni cleric of Zahedan in the southeast, also had called for an internationally monitored referendum. He said the government cannot push back a nation by killings and suppressing protesters. His request was met with harsh rejection by Iranian authorities. The Sunni Kurdish clerics also called for the unconditional release of all those arrested recently and warned the government against executing protesters. Despite warnings by international and human rights organizations, Iran's judiciary has issued death sentences for some protesters on charges of war against God. The country has been rocked by protests since mid-September following the death of 22-year-old Mahsa Amini, who was an Iranian Kurdish woman. A London-born woman who traveled to ISIS-controlled Syria at age 15 was influenced and affected by a determined propaganda machine, her lawyer said. Lawyers for Shamima Begum called on the British government to restore her UK citizenship on Monday, saying she likely was a victim of human trafficking. Begum traveled to Syrian territory then controlled by ISIS in 2015 with two school friends from East London. She was stripped of her citizenship in 2019 after being found in a camp in northeastern Syria for the families of suspected ISIS fighters and people fleeing them. Begum had been in detention in Syria ever since. She gave birth to a child in the camp, but the baby died weeks later. Begum has said she had two other children in Syria who also died. The British government says Begum, who was born in the UK, is entitled to Bangladeshi citizenship through her parents. Bangladeshi authorities have rejected claims that Begum is a Bangladeshi citizen. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, you could be me. For just one hour Walk a mile in my shoes Walk a mile in my shoes Dad! They took over my bedroom! Come on, come on! Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving.
stop this genocide. We need your help. Welcome back. It's time for in-depth analysis segment. Let's watch. Thank you, Samana. Climate change summit in Egypt is over, but conversation continued. With us is an expert who has been with us before, Professor Fadil Khaboub. Professor Khaboub is Associate Professor of Economics and President of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you for having me back on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Professor, are you happy about the loss and damage fund deal at the Egyptian summit on climate change? Well, the uh, introduction of the loss and damage fund is a, is a tremendous achievement for countries uh, from the global south because it's been uh, a demand by developing countries for the last uh, 30 years uh, since the 1992 uh, Rio summit. Um, it's, it's a tremendous achievement in the sense that we finally have countries from the global north agreeing that a fund needs to be established in order to provide grants, not loans, and technical assistance to the most vulnerable countries in order to deal with the negative consequences of climate damage, of climate change. Uh, the question that remains is how much money will be put in this fund how the funds will be allocated, and most importantly, how quickly will this fund be actually uh, made operational. Uh, we're hoping that COP28 next year uh, in the UAE will be the COP where the funds will actually be put in place and the funding unleashed to help the most vulnerable countries uh, deal with, uh, with the ongoing uh, climate crisis. Uh, the part that is uh, a little bit unclear, and that will be the, the hard work and the negotiations over the next 12 months, is to determine the actual level of responsibility for countries in the global north. We know who has emitted the most since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's very clear it's, it's the industrialized countries. But there's also the question of the role of China and India in CO2 emissions, especially in the last two decades. That remains to be negotiated, uh, meaning that a lot of the emissions from China and India in particular in the last two decades, um, it's true they're coming from China and India, but it's really for the purpose of producing consumer goods that are actually consumed in the global north. So to some extent, the global north still has a substantial responsibility for the CO2 emissions that are also coming from China and India. Um, so it, it remains to be seen how the global north will negotiate the role of China, the role of uh, India uh, in this uh, uh, loss and damage fund. Uh, the US has made it very clear that the US doesn't want countries like China, for example, to be a recipient of uh, loss and damage funds. Uh, so we'll, it, there's there's a very clear agreement that the majority of the global south has not been responsible for climate change and is currently on the front lines of climate change. Let's remind our uh, viewers here that the entire continent uh, of Africa emits the same amount of uh, CO2 emissions as Spain alone. Uh, and Spain is not the most industrialized country in, in the global north. So we're very clear in terms of the level of responsibility and where the financial resources need to flow. There's going to be a little bit of negotiations related to the amounts and the speed with which these funds will be uh, unlocked. What made America turn around? They were not willing to have be with this deal. What helps them move forward? Uh, I think it was a, a lot of the organizing and the uh, and the building of of the coalition from the global south uh, that made it very clear that the the science is very clear in terms of who's responsible. And the science and the economics are very clear that the most vulnerable countries will not be able to decarbonize, will not be able to give up fossil fuel um, uh, production and yet achieve, 
the economic development targets, the Millennium Development Goals, and, and address the multitudes of crises that we're dealing with in the Global South, unless there's an actual uh, financial compensation for the ongoing loss and damage that developing countries struggle with. Uh, the U.S. was uh, essentially left alone um, uh, from uh, within the global community as, as the only country that opposed uh, loss and damage for, for a long time. Uh, and I think with, with the help of a handful of uh, European countries, such as Denmark in, in particular, um, there's been a little bit of compromising done because this COP would have been a total failure uh, if it wasn't for the agreement on, on loss and damage fund because we've been talking about climate change and reducing emissions for the last uh, 27 COPs uh, consecutively and there was never uh, funding actually put in place to help the Global South uh, deal with the climate crisis. So I think it was... Um, uh, a great success in, in, in restoring faith in the multilateral process in the UN system that we can actually achieve um, and, and make progress on, on the climate front. Uh, it's a step in the right direction, but we really need that follow-up step, which is the actual funding. Now, notice that the U.S. didn't agree to uh, a particular responsibility assigned to itself. Uh, didn't agree to a particular responsibility assigned to particular corporations, especially the fossil fuel industry. Uh, that remains the sticky point. And the U.S. didn't agree to a particular amount. So the the uh, the efforts needs to be uh, doubled in the next uh, 12 months to make sure that the amount that we put into the loss and damage fund is actually commensurate with the need of developing countries and commensurate with the proportional responsibility of countries um, in terms of their cumulative historic emissions since the Industrial Revolution. And of course, the US um, uh, has the largest share of CO2 emissions historically, close to um, uh, 50% of global emissions uh, the majority of global emissions come from the U.S., the European Union, uh, and the rest of uh, the global north, uh, Africa as a whole, in terms of its, uh, not just Africa, the global south as a whole, uh, in terms of historic uh, emissions, uh, contributed less than 8% total to global emissions. Professor Kabu, do you think the major polluters, number one being our country, the United States of America, is going to pay its fair share. If they are number one polluter, the percentage of the pollution which comes here, comes from there, will that be the percentage of their contribution to this particular fund? Uh, that remains to be seen. And that's where the negotiations over the next 12 months will culminate into a particular formula, hopefully. Uh, my personal view that uh, uh, clearly the U.S. and Western Europe have the largest responsibility uh, in terms of contributing to CO2 emissions, green gas houses, and, and so on. But in terms of the contribution, I would hope that we would be creative enough to find practical solutions that will be a combination of debt cancellation for the global south, coupled with actual transfer of financial resources, actual transfer of technology, in-kind transfer of resources to build transportation infrastructure, agricultural capacity for food sovereignty, and, and transfer of technology and know-how to build uh, productive capacity in the global south. So we really need to think in terms of a combination of payments as opposed to just a cash payment without changing any of the structural economic uh, issues that persist. One of the things that and what were very clear in this uh, in this COP uh, uh, meeting was the success of the Global South and putting on the table uh, a particular item that needs to be undone and redesigned, uh, which is the global trade and financial architecture that we can't decouple uh, CO2 emissions and pollution and climate change from actual economic architecture. And that has to be redesigned if we're going to move forward. And I think COP28 will be uh, the culmination of this climate finance framework that will be directly linked 
to redesigning the global trade and, and finance architecture. And what about China? Do you think China will be able to contribute according to its fair share of the pollution? In terms of capability, yes, absolutely. The U.S. is capable, China is capable in terms of uh, financial contribution, in-kind contribution, and technological contribution. That is transfer of technology, transfer of know-how, transfer of capabilities. And in terms of debt cancellation, uh, both the U.S. and China are capable of canceling uh, debt. So it's very important that moving forward, this loss and damage fund doesn't devolve into a loan program. It needs to evolve into a true climate reparations program that repairs the damage with financial transfers, debt cancellation, and transfer of technology and know-how and, and uh, productive capacity. Professor Khaboub, uh, please share with us, was this deal the main thing or there were some other accomplishments uh, of this uh, Egyptian summit on climate change? I think the, the greatest achievement of, uh, of this uh, COP27 was uh, building a global South coalition around a coherent message uh, and not uh, giving up on that message, which is you know, the Global South went into this meeting insisting that we can't leave from Sharm el-Sheikh, from Egypt, without an agreement on loss and damage fund. I mean, the hope was that uh, we would get it on the agenda to begin with. But the fact that loss and damage was not even on the initial agenda, was not even to be discussed or negotiated, and we ended up with it being put back on the agenda and with it being part of the, the final agreement of COP27, that was a, a great success. But once we put loss and damage on the table, the next question pops up immediately, which is what about the rest of the economic system that prevents developing countries from actually having their own capabilities and financial resources? And that's going to be the challenge for the next COP is to how we how do we link uh, economic development, the economic and trade financial architecture to our efforts to fighting climate change? And none of that was the success or the, uh, the achievement of the global north, of the European Union, or of the United States or China. It was primarily the collective effort, starting with some of the smallest countries on the planet, uh, Vanuatu, uh, Barbados. These are the countries that really led the effort to bringing uh, a coalition of, of global south countries. Now, the remaining piece that we uh, failed to deliver in this COP is calling out uh, the fossil fuel industry and making sure that we have an international agreement to stop the construction of additional fossil fuel infrastructure and to rapidly phase out all fossil fuel production, not just coal, coal, oil, and gas. Now, that was not part of uh, the, the success story. That was uh, the failure of this COP is failing to, to call for uh, an international uh, uh, negotiation of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty uh, that would help us end the production of fossil fuels, not just reduce uh, emissions. Professor, do you think this climate change summit happening every year uh, will lose its importance because they are not achieving much and they are becoming routine? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I think if, if anything, the work that happens during the 12 months between each one of the COP meetings is, is the most important work. Because at the end of the day, the, the two weeks where uh, countries from around the world meet to finalize an agreement, uh, the work doesn't start in the beginning of, uh, of, of that conference. The work begins today. Today, we begin the work for COP28 with countries from around the world putting forward some of the most important agenda items that need to be discussed, that need to be agreed upon. And I would uh, urge all countries today to start the work for COP28 with two major agenda items. Number one, negotiating and agreeing to a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that would end the production of fossil fuels and phase out um, uh, and the, the, the construction of additional fossil fuel in infrastructure and phase out coal, oil, and gas 
on a rapid schedule immediately. Number two, the second agenda item, hopefully for next COP, is the negotiation of the precise formula with which substantial funding will be put into the loss and damage fund. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Khabu. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Back to you, Samana. Thank you. That's all from our Chicago studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Salam and good night.